Hello, welcome to The Power of TV. I'm Lorene Arbus, president of the Lorene Arbus Foundation and television production company. It's been my honor and pleasure to serve as a board member of the Television Academy Foundation to create and fund the Lorene Arbus Focus on Disability Scholarship for the past 10 years and to, to support this important panel about representation on television. This topic is very close to my heart and my life work with people with disability, which is the largest minority and very underrepresented group in all forms of media. Representation does matter. I thank you for joining us. And now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Ruben Garcia of the Creative Artists Agency. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Ruben Garcia, co-head of the Cultural Business Strategy Group at Creative Artist Agency. I'm so pleased to be here today and to continue our partnership with the Television Academy Foundation and this incredible Power of TV program. A big thank you to Lorene Arbus and the Lorene Arbus Foundation for their generosity and support of this panel and for all that they continue to do for the Television Academy Foundation and for the disability community. So listen, we have a great conversation planned. Let's not waste any more time. Today, we're gonna to have an important conversation about representation. We all know this is an important topic across Hollywood, and it's important that we all participate in these discussions to understand the problem, and more importantly, to raise awareness for the actions and the solutions to address these challenges. So with that said, we have a great panel of artists who are going to share their perspective on these issues and what they are doing to advance representation for all voices in this industry. All right, so up first, meet writer, actor, comedian, LGBTQ and disability advocate, Ryan O'Connell. Uh, he recently adapted his 2015 memoir, I'm Special and Other Lies We Tell Ourselves, about his life as a gay man with cerebral palsy into the groundbreaking television series special for Netflix, uh, which has a season two coming very soon. Originally from Ventura County, Ryan started his television writing career on MTV's Awkward, and he's also written for Daytime Divas and the reboot of Will and Grace, among others. After its first season, Special was nominated for four Emmy Awards, and he won a Special Recognition Award from GLAAD in 2020. So please welcome Ryan. Thank you. God, it means so much to be here on my first panel about representation in Hollywood. Just kidding, I do one once a week! <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad to be the weekly stop on the tour for you, Ryan. <laughs> thank you, um, thank you, thank you. Next up is my buddy, Stephen Canals, who is the co-creator and producer of the history-making series Pose on FX, which recently, I'm sad to say, completed shooting its final season. Uh, Stephen is originally from the Bronx and received his BA in cinema and a uh, master's degree from Binghamton University. I hope I got that right. In addition Binghamton. to his MFA in screenwriting from UCLA, I'm also a Bruin. That's one of the many things that I love about Stephen. Um, as mentioned, Pose has made incredible television history by featuring the largest cast of transgender actors in series regular roles and features the largest recurring cast of LGBTQ characters ever for a scripted series. And perhaps one of the most powerful elements of the show is the ripple effect. One such example, Billy, Billy Porter uh, became the first openly gay black man to win an Emmy for outstanding lead actor in a drama for his role as Pray Tell on this series. That is no doubt in large part because of the creative mastermind that is Stephen Canals. So Stephen, welcome. Thank you for having me. And finally, we have uh, someone who is truly a woman of many talents. Tony nominated actress, Ashley Park. She currently stars as Mindy Chen on the popular Netflix show, Emily in Paris, for which she earned a Critics Choice Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress. She also received a Drama Desk Award nomination in addition to that Tony nom for originating the role of Gretchen Wieners in the Broadway musical, Mean Girls. Uh, originally from Ann Arbor and of Korean descent, Ashley has been a longtime uh, activist and supported the work of many leading organizations like Covenant House, Broadway Cares, and the Actors Fund, uh, among many, many, many others. And something tells me we are just getting started with you, Ashley Park. So welcome. Yay! It's always fun to hear parts of your bio. Also, my mom went right? to UCLA too. So. Okay. 
So that, I, I'm a big fan of anybody that went to UCLA. I'm a big, big, big Bruin fan here. Um, so listen, guys, I, I want to jump in. I want to, you know, have as much time to get into the specifics as possible. But I love an origin story. I love to know where you all started. So I actually want to start with hearing about your first job in this business. What was it? How'd you get it? And uh, was it as horrible as most people say the first job in the industry is? So, Ashley, why don't we start with you? Oh, gosh. Um, well, my first job um, in New York was actually my first like acting job in New York was super fun because I was in the ensemble of Mamma Mia. And I went in, I think, their seventh year on Broadway. And I was an understudy for some parts, too. And that was my Broadway debut. And um, it was the time of my life. It was very I felt like it was very much like my freshman year of Broadway, where it's kind of like you get to just like go in and see what's up and um, learn everything and like observe and not have a lot of pressure or stakes on you. Um, so I think that was my first like professional job in New York. That's great. I love a good Broadway job. I love a good Broadway origin story. Uh, Ryan, we, we mentioned in your brief intro that your one of your first writing jobs was on MTV's Awkward. Was that your first industry job or your first writing yes. job? Yes, I, I feel like I need to tell this story behind Bulletproof Glass because the way I got my first job was not usually how it works, which is that I moved to L.A. wanting to write for TV, um, didn't know how it worked. I didn't even come during pilot staffing season for network TV, which is like usually like when you go. I went after and um, my agent was like, well, what shows do you like watching? And I was like, I really like that show Awkward on MTV. He's like, oh, it's staffing right now. I was submitted. I met with the showrunners like a week after I moved here and then I got staffed like two days later. And I truly, I understand it's a lot harder than <laughs> usually. I didn't know. Trust me, she paid her dues later when it almost was a year and a half until after Awkward Route that I got another job. So then I really got a crash course into how hard it is. Trust. But um, it was amazing. It was, a, it was a really, really great experience. I was just very, very green. I didn't even know what a general meeting was. Oh, I wish I could go back to that place. I wish I still didn't know what that was. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was really amazing. And I think because I didn't really know about the industry or like understand any of it, I think it was just, um, I don't know. It was, really, it was really fun. I wasn't like a jaded bitch. You know, that's now. <laughs> You become over time. That's what we're meant to become, right? <laughs> exactly. 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 Um, Stephen, what about you? I feel like I have two first. Um, my, I would say my first like position that was my like entree to the to the industry was working as a research assistant to Dustin Lance Black, um, who won an Oscar for writing Milk. Um, and that was an incredible opportunity to be in close proximity to someone who, you know, had the kind of career that I was was hoping to have in this industry. Um, and then my first professional writing job uh, was being staffed on a show that aired on, on Freeform called Dead of Summer. And so I got to work with Adam Horowitz and Eddie Kitsis, who created Once Upon a Time and also worked on great shows like Lost. Um, so that was a really awesome opportunity. Amazing. And here you are now with a history making television show that again, I'll say it again. I am so sad. This is going to be the final season, um, but I also can't wait. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Um, let, let's shift gears here to start the conversation on what we're here to talk about, right? Um, and I, I want to start by saying this, what I'm loving about this panel and how it came together and all of you being here is I actually think each and every one of you represents the future of entertainment and the future of our industry because you are all bold, talented storytellers and artists. Um, and we're just starting to get to know you, but I feel so great and so much better knowing that you're out in the world doing this work. Um, I want to start actually by talking about some of the, the shows, right? I want to start, Ryan, with you. Um, going back to, you know, the early days of special, my guess, I'm going to take mm. a guess, much like you uh, uh, might imagine. My guess is that you walked right into your first pitch and sold special right away off the bat and everybody wanted it. Um, buyers must have loved what you cooked up. So tell us, what was the pitch process like for you? 
Yeah, it was a, a rude awakening. Um, yeah, it was not like that at all. Um, actually, our first pitch was Netflix and they passed. Pause for laughs. Um, <laughs> that was in 2015. Um, and, uh, you know, I had my dream team. I had Jim Parsons, um, this writer, John Regi, who's incredible, Craig Johnson, uh, the director. And uh, everyone loved the pitches. Every time we left a pitch, we're like, we're going to sell that. And then one by one, they all didn't make offers. I mean, really, like how Hollywood works is like you get some like really amazing gay executive who's like obsessed with what you're doing. And then they have to like run your idea up to the flagpole to someone named Tom who's like straight and like lives in Redondo Beach and it's like 55. And then he's like, wait, I don't understand. We're not making this dot, dot, dot. And then Tom kills your show. And then the gay executive is devastated. So that's like literally the journey of how things don't get made. Um, but yeah, it was really, really, really hard. Everyone passed. And then we went to this digital incubator uh, of Warner Brothers called Stage 13 and they commissioned me to write eight 15 minute episodes and then I did that and then we sent the episodes to Netflix like fully finished and then they greenlit us but it took four years door to door and I, I still feel like we kind of like snuck into the back door because um, we made season one for truly two dollars in Austin Texas and I feel like like everyone was just like sure good luck with your projects you know what I mean but um it was really, really arduous. And there were so many times where I wanted to give up because it felt hopeless, but I didn't. And now I'm here. <laughs> you did it. You did it. And thank goodness you did. That show, I, I love, I binged it twice. Um, oh, I thank you. you we're we're going to talk a bit more about that um, in a moment as well. You know, Steven, you know, version of the same question to you. My assumption is, is you walked in and said, here's my idea and everybody wanted it. <laughs> That's the dream world that I like to think we're living in. But what was the process like bringing Pose to life? Um, it was from the moment that I completed the first draft of the pilot to meeting Ryan Murphy two and a half years um, of going in and out of rooms and talking about this story. Um, it, that original draft of Pose was my lead sample. So all those generals that Ryan was talking about earlier, I was getting them on the strength of the post pilot. So the reality is that the whether folks wanted to meet with me or not, uh, that script was being circulated everywhere. And when I was taking meetings and specifically pitching it, or if I was trying to make a general into a, hey, would you like to attach as a producer, um, or as a studio, uh, more often than not, I was being told, you're never gonna get the money to make this because you're a baby writer. Um, you, you know, there isn't a market for a story like this. I don't know who the audience is. I don't know where a show like this lives. Um, and my, my managers actually track all of my meetings. And so I had 166 meetings prior to meeting with Sherry Marsh, who was the first executive after two and a half years, who said, this is more than just a sample. This is a television show. We need to get this sold. And she is the one who introduced me to Ryan Murphy. Wow. 166 meetings before getting that show sold. That is amazing. And uh, to think what the world would be, you know, the television landscape would look like without a show like Pose, I think is, is devastating. I'm going to come back to some of the points that you made um, in a moment. But Ashley, I wanted to pivot to you, you know, a version of the same question. Um, you recently spoke at an Amplify event that we did, and your segment in particular was um, surprising the very cute Alan Kim, um, who is a big fan of yours. And the joy and excitement, not just on his face, but on his little sister's face and the mom screaming in the background must have felt just so incredible to you. What does it mean to you as an artist um, and as a creator to know that that's the kind of impact that you're having on audiences who are tuning in to your work? Well, I also... <laughs> I can't get out of my head 166 meetings right now. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time pivoting from that because it's just like, if you hadn't sat through 166 meetings, like I have such 
you executive producers and you people like you you making these things i'm still like on that right now like that show wouldn't have happened if you didn't sit through 166 general meetings that's crazy to me sorry um but um what was my question again <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Listen, it's it's a mind blowing thing to think about that the the level of dedication yeah. that it takes. because when you think about the type of work that you guys created, it's also creating incredible opportunities for talented folks like Ashley, right? Who you get to go I'm out into the world. It feels, it's it's so selfless, and I have I've you know as I get to more know more producers and writers, especially, it really is just like such a selfless act being able to put those stories out there and I feel very honored. I mean, the reason that Alan Kim and his sister Alyssa, um, she's a huge musical theater fan. So she was, I think in the tour Frozen or something. And um, I think her seeing the Mean Girls poster and seeing that someone who looked like her was in a show like that gave her impetus to really believe, like to not even question that she could be a part of that kind of world. Um, I think it means everything to me. I think, um, to be frank, um, as anybody starting out, whether it's writer, actor, any creative, um, at first we're just trying to figure out how to get a job, right? And it's a, it, it, feel, it feels to me, I'll call myself selfish. So I felt very um, undeserving for a while um, with so many people saying, you're such an inspiration. You have, you've knocked down buildings. You just doing your job has really opened up gates for us and I felt undeserving of that because I was like I'm just here trying to tell the best story and play the best most honest characters that I could like how can I how do I deserve that um and the more I, I realized the more that um we work and we, we develop as humans too um it's our responsibility to kind of acknowledge when we have that platform when we have those opportunities because it really does it shapes I mean the the, the coolest thing when in talking to Alan Kim he's the star of Minari and he's what nine years old now um and in talking to him about representation what was so mind-blowing and like it makes me want to cry now to me was that he's still in the stage of being untainted he in terms of like not even like to him like the movie that he's seen the most and been most involved with was a story about people who looked like us and who had um our sort of story and so that's such a beautiful it gave me so much hope to be like wow this younger generation, they're, they're people who are gonna watch Pose and Special and see see themselves and not, in, and where they're the protagonists, that's like insanely cool that this younger generation has that. And um, that's, why, that's, that's why we have to keep speaking up and have to be so diligent about the stories we tell now because it actually, it really does make a difference. You're absolutely right. And actually, Stephen, I want to go back to something that you said, because I think this is a pretty common thing, particularly as we're in a world right now and in a moment where people are asking for more diverse content, whatever that means. You can fill that blank in in a lot of different ways. But some of the specific feedback that you got is we don't know where this show lives. We don't know, you know if there's an audience for this show um and what you know one of the things that i think you, you both in, in the shows that you created did so beautifully is you created you know you created stories about the humanity of people right it doesn't feel so much about this is a show about again fill in the blank so i i, I say that to you stephen because i'm curious when you got that feedback did that force you in any way to kind of like reshape your pitch that that helped along the way or were you like were you able to consistently stay and say this is the community this is what i want to do this is what i want to do or did you actually have to how did you navigate that process um you know i think that it a large part of navigating going into rooms and being told no um and having the resilience and the persistence to keep moving has everything to do with living in a world that tells me that I am less than because of my identities. And I know that that's something that will resonate with both Ryan and with Ashley, right? So whether you are a person of color, whether you're a woman, whether you're LGBTQ+, whether you're differently abled, like we're constantly being reminded of our deficit 
because of those identities, particularly in in this country. And so I think, you know, since I was a boy, especially someone who grew up in housing projects in the Bronx, I was hyper aware that I was always going to have to work 10 times harder to make inroads. So my feeling when I was going into rooms and being told no was, okay, you're just not the right collaborator. You're not the right person for me to work on this project with. And so let me continue to forge ahead until I find that person or those people. Um, there was never a part of my brain that thought I'm going to stop because the, the stakes felt too high. I think it's everything that Ashley was just saying in relation to Alan, right? It's like, I think about specifically, you know, when you look at all of the anti-Asian hate that has happened in the last couple of months, and let's be honest, like this is pre-pandemic, but it's heightened as a result of the pandemic. And so in the midst of all of that, you have a beautiful movie like Minari coming out. You have representation like Ashley being, in, you know, a, a face in all the work that she's done. You have someone like uh, Yu Jung Yoon winning an Oscar, like being able to see yourself in that way to turn on a television screen and say, oh, there's me, or there's a version of myself is so critically important. You know, someone turning on uh, Netflix and seeing special, you know, if, if I'm struggling to find my, my place in the world, you know, and I'm being told I'm less than, there's a show that tells me being different is absolutely okay and validates my experience and my existence, you know? And so I think it's, it's not fair, but I think the work of myself and Ryan and Ashley, and I think all of our co-conspirators who are having to deal with identities that are looked at as less than, it's our job in this industry to push networks and executives and studios to realize that our content isn't niche. You know, that, that niche really is the mainstream and that audiences are looking for specificity, not just because it makes the content more interesting, but beyond that, it matters you know, that it's going to help create a world that is more just, that is more equitable, um, and hopefully shift away from all of the, from all of the hate and all of the hurt that we're currently dealing with. That was so beautifully said. And, you know, one of the things that I think is really important, particularly since we have a lot of young people tuning in is, you know, what you were saying about every time you heard no, what really you thought was, well, you're not the right collaborator for me, right? That that means, you know, we're not, we're not going to be in this together and that's okay on to the next. And to not have that be a statement of your talent and your creativity because it's a no. It's just you found someone who can't see, you know, eye to eye with you. Um, Ryan, I'd, I'd love your take on this as well because I think, again, often and when we talk about this space, you know, we put our shows in buckets, right? And your show is is one of those where, you know, it beautifully represents a lot of different things, including, you know, again, a protagonist, a lead character with a disability. How did you navigate the creative process of a special? And how did you navigate the pushback where people were like, you know, if they told you, which I, I'm going to venture a guess, I don't know how many meetings you had, but I'm going to venture a guess, people probably told you the same, a version of the same thing they said to Steven. We don't know where yeah. the show lives. We don't know where the audience is. Yeah, which was such a brutal mistake because those people didn't know that being told no is my heroine. I'm addicted to it because I live to, to prove people wrong, especially guys named Tom that live in Redondo Beach, like addicted to making Tom feel like a fool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that is like, that is definitely like, I was watching The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary, and he was like, <laughs> He was talking about how like he truly like what motivates him is just like kind of good old fashioned revenge or like a perceived slight and like getting back at the person. I'm like, am I Michael Jordan? Like, <laughs> it's like, like I truly like, I feel like as a marginalized person, I feel like I'm always triumphing against like adversity or some kind of like roadblock that I actually don't know how else to create, which honestly is fucked up. If you want to be like, a therapist about it, you're like, gee, like what would it be like if I was like Tim Allen? Do you know what I mean? Like, what would it be like if I was like Rob Schneider, circa the late 90s, where you're just like, everything is just a green light. You're like, yes, yes, yes. Like, please, like, you know, pass, go, collect $200 on the Monopoly game of life. Like, you get to go, you get to go. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think everyone here can relate to uh, not being represented on screen. And we talk about representation and why it matters, but it's very clear where it's like TV and film implicitly tells the culture who and who does not matter. So when you're not being represented, it's in you, the message is received, you do not matter. So, you know, I think as hard as it was, I think of the show special, like if it had been around when I was a teenager or whatever, it would have saved me a th like thousands and thousands of dollars on therapy. And just like, even on a practical level, like this business is so, such a slog and you do so much work and you can work in a vacuum and things can never get made, blah, 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 blah. That like, to me, everything I do has to be worthwhile because it's like, again, so much of it's not going to work out and you're going to spend so much time. Like, I mean, sure. Like I could probably like go sell a show about a girl with magical bangs to ABC and buy my house in Malibu. But like that truly would like, like <laughs> my bones would turn to crushed ice. Do you know what I mean? Like it is really, really important that the work is meaningful and that it's contributing to something to the culture because otherwise why the hell are you doing it? Um, Creatively with special, I was I was really really lucky with Netflix because they let me do whatever I wanted. I also think like when you're buying something from me for better or for worse, you know what it is. So like trying to like water it down is like a, a fruitless endeavor. I think like I think if you're buying into what I'm selling, you're like fully on board, and that may include like an anal sex journey, frank discussions about disability, like whatever, baby, you're on board. You bought it. You know what I mean? You can't you can't be confused. So. I think that was like, I think the best experience because I think also we can relate to like maybe selling something and then seeing it get watered down or seeing it become something that, um, you know, it, that is so far from its original intention. And so having Netflix allow me to do exactly what I wanted to do was the most incredible part and having it not be a fight. That's amazing. You know, you're bringing something up that um, I, I think is also really important that we need to have that we need to discuss in this particular conversation, right? Which is the difference between representation and visibility, right? Visibility, you know, in my point of view is like, look, yes, you can maybe see yourself on screen as the background character or someone who just comes in and out of a scene very quickly. Representation is about the nuance. It's about the cultural authenticity. It's about a respect for the community. Um, and Ashley, something that you were saying about, you know, Alan and, and your conversation with Alan really struck, which is like, that is an excellent example of representation, right? Which goes far, far, far beyond visibility. Um, how, how have you, you know, navigated this industry in that way? You're, first of all, you're the only woman on our panel. And then your identity is so layered. You're an Asian woman in this industry that is, you know, a community that's been severely impacted. Um, not again, pre pandemic, but as, as Stephen mentioned, heightened so much as a result of the pandemic. Um, how do you navigate conversations about representation and visibility as an actor on these shows? Do you feel empowered um, to speak up and say, not, you know, this probably isn't something that would happen. This isn't something I feel comfortable with to get and push beyond the boundaries of what visibility is and into the space of representation. Yeah, I think my answer now, you know, we're about to start shooting season two of Emily in Paris. My answer now is probably different than it was a year and a half ago. And I think, um, you know, Stephen brought up the, you know, the anti-Asian attacks that have been so, um, finally heavily shown via media and such lately. And I think that my, and I'm sure like all of us throughout this time of like the last year or two have um, really been sitting with myself to figure out how I've also been complicit in all of this. Um, for me, first of all, as an actor and at, you know, as someone who's now, um, who's able to speak up about certain things, I'm like, how did I get to this position? Like how, how, I don't think I'm the most talented or the prettiest or the smartest or any of these things. Like, how, what are the steps that brought me to this place? Um, and I think I did very, very, very well in the Broadway world and beyond at convincing myself and everyone else that I was white. You know, um, it, if I could go, my goal whenever I was on a Broadway stage, um, and there are pros to this too, was for to be so, the character to be so, 
everything that everyone forgot that I was not white. If I could leave a rehearsal room, an audition, um, a night on the stage, a night on set, and have everyone have forgotten that I was Asian, successful day. You know, because that's how I could connect to people, and that's what I saw growing up. Um, and I attest a lot of my humor and everything that about me to shows that I saw growing up, and I love them for it. But and not in one TV show that I watched growing up was there anybody who looked like me. Um, and it's not until recently where I was like, oh, I'm complicit in it because I bought into that. I said, how can I, I'm as ambitious, I, I, I love a no as well, Ryan. You know, it's like, how do I get there? Oh, it's by making sure everyone forgets that I'm Asian. And I think the question that you brought up, Ruben, in terms of representation versus um, the other is, a conversation I've been having a lot lately about like colorblind casting versus color conscious casting, um, especially, and I just finished a film um, called Mr. Malcolm's List, we just filmed in Ireland, and it's going to be the first Hollywood um, movie that takes place in the 18th century British Regency era. It's very like Jane Austen that is color consciously cast in a diverse cast, you know, um, and the difference being when I entered the industry in Mamma Mia, we were like, oh my God, the glass ceiling has been shattered. Like they have people of all colors on the stage. Like that's color blind casting. Because you go to that, you go to watch other shows I've done. And the goal is to be like, there is no race. Everyone's the same. How great, what a colorful world we live in, you know? And I realized that, oh, what actually has to happen is color conscious casting where it is that where um, people who are from all walks of life and who look different, everything, there's no margins anymore. Those protagonists, um, th their names are the storytelling, and it's not something we're trying to ignore. And so every step of my career so far, every time something good has happened, I've always been like, oh, yes, I got that in spite of being Asian. And now I'm like, oh, it's my job to make sure that at least I have the attitude of going into stuff. I got this, I'm doing this, and I'm Asian. Not, yes, I got rid of that. Um, and it's been a very recent um, kind of, you know, I'm, I'm really, really, really thinking about it in terms of identity and such as well. And um, yeah, so I don't know if I answered the question, but. No, no you yeah. did, you did. I think, I actually, I think, again, that was beautifully said, this idea of shifting to being, you know, color conscious casting, the, I, the opportunity to be, um, you know, artists and creators who can make bold decisions that are authentically representing our communities and to be proud and step into our authenticity because it's our it's our greatest calling card at the end of the oh, day. Well, and and I, really the other thing I wanted to say too is I think it's so, um, I think the most dangerous thing um, as well was tokenism, was having that one gay guy, that one Asian girl, that one person who is differently able, like, you know, um, before because what that has done and we've seen it now reflected in our world is say there's only room for one. Like I found my most value before when I was a, in a room with all white people because I was like, I got the spot, you know, and if I was surrounded mm -hmm. and working with other Asian people, then I was my work was lesser, which is totally not how I'm thinking, now, you know, like I, I just it, it was just like a mind blowing. Oh, no, a total pivot from that. Um, yeah. Whereas I'm, I'm hungry and desperate to work with people who have lived my same narrative in life so that you can show the, that's why Pose was so amazing. It's like you, ha you have all of these people who've experienced the same thing. So you can really talk about what humans are going through and what love looks like and what relationships are. And so we're not just being like, great, I have to spend all this time because I'm the only one of this identity. So I just think tokenism was, um, we thought was such a barrier breaking point and it was actually very, very dangerous. Yeah, and I, but I also think like Hollywood is still living by that tokenism. Like I feel like they're like, oh, we have our trans show. We, we sell trans rights. We have Pose. Like, oh, disability. Like, oh, we have special, like, da-da. I think that there's still that kind of we checked the box. Now we're good because it's all about like optics, you know? And I, and I wish, by the way, in these panels about representation, I would be addicted to see a panel of like executives that actually have green light power for shows and hold their feet to the fire and talk about their accountability. Cause like, as career, like, like we are in some semblance of power, the three of us, which is great, but there's a ceiling at the end of the day, again, the decision, like the things we want to make go up the flagpole. And like, I would love to hear those executives talk about that because I think they still, some of them still exist in this kind of 
idea of like, well, we have this already, so we don't need more than one. You know, there's, and then the, by the way, that attitude bleeds down to marginalized people and we're taught that there's one seat at the table. So if you get that seat, oh, motherfucker, that person took my goddamn seat. Like, what am I going to do? And then that creates this like kind of weird tension within the marginalized communities. And I don't know, it's all very herbally fully loaded. But like, I, I think it's, it's amazing to have these conversations from like the, like from the three of us, but it's also like, it's frustrating because like there's only so much we can do as well. Do you know what I mean? Like we're not the ones that are like, you get a series order. And it's like, I would love to hear their fucking thought process, TBH. <laughs> I agree. Honestly, I think that would be so chic to put all those people in a room together, right? And have a conversation. Because I think part two, you know, we th there's this thing uh, that, that you guys are doing, right? Which is normalizing, you know, underrepresented and mar marginalized communities through your work. Every single action that we take, it's feels almost calculated, right? For I, I would imagine for all, myself as an executive, for the three of you who represent different communities, like there is the additional tax of being part of the community because then that's that's added pressure onto your show. That's added pressure onto your role. That's added pressure that majority of the creators in this industry, you know, don't necessarily have to think about. But, you know, I, I want to actually take this one step further, you know, Stephen, I, a question that I had for you was um, to kick us off here, being these people, right, to be the one, to be the only, it, it might be an honor to be the first, but it's not a great feeling to be the only. And that that is something that I think we want to work towards, right, normalizing what we see on our screens. I can't imagine, though, in this process, that it's that everybody's always happy. Right. So you took this show with, you know, an incredible LGBTQ cast. You addressed issues that probably were not seen on TV f before. I'm curious to know, how did the community respond? And did you get any feedback that kind of took you through a loop? Because my, my guess is you can't please everyone. Right. Um, and I imagine that that weight might might weigh on you a little bit as a creator as well. Sure. I think to address what, what you were just discussing um, prior to this question, I just want to say that there's a big difference between a moment and a movement. And I think that, um, you know, to, to specifically address your question and thinking about it in the context of Pose, um, I think that Pose has been discussed like it's a movement and perhaps it's the beginning of one, but uh, and not to be glib, but I think that for me, it really feels like a moment. Movement, I mean, it remains to be seen because the reality is that, you know, just in the past month, we saw all this anti-trans legislation, right? That was happening. And so, uh, you know, in the LGBTQ community, like we were mobilizing, you know, and, and you know, now there's all these anti-trans bills for uh, young people in sports. And so, you know, the reality is, it's like, okay, so we have a show, <laughs> you know, we have a show with some representation and that's great and that is important and I will never minimize that. But, you know, if, if, again, to, to think maybe more specifically about our community, um, where are all the other trans narratives, right? So it's like, we have, a show that made history before it ever even debuted because we cast not one but five trans black and afro latin trans women in series regular roles you know and part of the reason that we did that was to show that you know queer and trans people are not a monolith right you know like ryan and i are having very different experiences being part of the queer community so let's let's honor the fact that there's diversity within our community. And yet, I'm not really seeing a lot of other trans narratives. And I think to Ashley's point earlier, it's like, there's only ever room for one. So like, I know plenty of shows where they're like, we're gonna make that character trans, but it's like, are you just doing it because it's in vogue? Because it seems like hip and cool to do, or, you know, like it, it feels like a, a glorified version of tokenization. And so, you know, I think I'm still in a space where I'm waiting to see that true progress because I know that there are other 
queer and trans content creators who have stories to tell, and I'm not seeing those stories being told. Um, in terms of the, your question about the community, I think the community was really excited, but I know that like when our first season aired, um, I remember one of the conversations that I saw happening on social media was around um, specifically members of our community who identify as bisexual were like, oh, I wonder where, like where we fit into this narrative because it seems like it's just gonna be focused on trans women. Um, and I think that we all are in a place where we're fighting so hard to be seen. And I think this speaks to the anecdote that Ashley shared earlier, which I think is so critically important about feeling value as an Asian woman being in a space of primarily white people because I get to be the only one. And so that affirms my identity. And I think that we're in a place now where it's like, while fighting so hard to be seen that it creates all this weird tension and infighting. And so instead of being happy for my brethren, regardless of what their specific identity is, it's like, well, I'm not part of that. And that's not cool, you know? And so I think that, um, I think that shifted once people saw the show because they think they were just moved by the characters and the themes. Um, but the reality is like, there's still so much more work to be done, you know, and there's still so much more visibility. And I think that um, it's hard work, but I think it's so critically important. You know, I think that my experience as an Afro Latin person is similar to Ashley's experience, right? Which is like, you know, it's very easy to kind of give us one umbrella term, you know, Ashley's Asian, Stephen's, you know, Latinx. And suddenly it's like, we forget that within that, you know, the diaspora is so wide and it's so rich. And so, you know, to be Chinese is different from being Korean, you know, which is different from being Japanese and the way that being Puerto Rican is different from Dominican, which is different from Cuban, which is different from Mexican. And so it's like, it's really, it's, it's like the responsibility falls on us to have to always do the educating. Um, but it feels critically important, especially in this time to be doing that. I feel like I went way away from the question you asked, but <laughs> you actually d absolutely did not. I, and I'm I, like, what you just said was so important, recognizing both as creators and folks tuning in who are in positions of power at our companies. There's a difference between a moment and a movement. There's a very big difference between visibility and representation. There's a very, very beautiful culture behind the people that you're meeting with. Um, and it is unfair for any of us who identify as part of fill in the blank community to be tapped to be the representative of all things of the monolith of the fill in the blank of 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 etc right and i think that will move our our business so much further ahead um if we can just have conversations that recognize that right that allow us to just like be a little bit curious it's okay um to do that i mean actually i'd love to your point of view on on this next question, which is more about the moment and whether or not we think our industry is going to have an easier time, right? So something that Steven said, right? This was a year of like, of, of learning, right? It shouldn't be on us to teach you so much of the language around how to deal with the summer and the, you know, the social unrest is go, learn, read, educate yourself. Um, that is not, you know, the job of the, you know, again, fill in the blank person to do. Um, but we heard a lot of that talk. Do you think that this summer is gonna actually impact the future of this industry? Do you think our our job as actors, as executives, as creators is gonna get more complicated, is gonna get harder in terms of, com of, of representation on screen? Or do you think that you're starting to see movement in a positive direction? Oh my gosh, I am not God. How am I supposed to, I'm not a psychic. No, but <laughs> no, but I think I, you know, like um, <laughs> to address. I mean, I wish I knew. I, you know what? I can be, I can be hopeful. I can be really fucking hopeful. And I think that. I mean, I think it's probably the reason. You know, Ryan, you mentioned how many panels have we been asked to be on and stuff. And one of the reasons I was like, this is an important one for me, not only because it's with Stephen and Ryan and you, Ruben, but I, I was like, we're talking to college kids, right? Like, this is like the hope is in you guys <laughs> who are listening you know um because so so i am hopeful but it, it's it's tough to say because 
first of all, like even if you, if, if even if I'm talking about like my community of Broadway, there's so much like what is, oh, we have to make all these changes right now. Broadway's dead. There is no Broadway right now. So it's so hard, and as we know, with anything, you can talk. You can talk about a TV show as much as you want when you're creating it. It's not until you're on the ground floor and you're doing it and you're making it that all those things you talked about can go into practice. So we're talking a lot about how people can be allies, like how stories like this can be told, and we can have hope in all of this stuff. But until we get the execs to listen, until we're actually like opened, the world is open again in a real way, we're not going to be able to really see if this can sustain or not. Um, and we can hope and be diligent about it. But um, I, yeah, I, I, I think that in, in terms of like, with something that you said, and I don't even know if it answers the question at all, but I just think it's an interesting point. And when Ryan had said, how many panels have I been on? It really like resonated with me because especially recently um, being asked to speak on these kinds of things. It's so funny. Even um, I, I posted a video after the Atlanta shootings and I, I was asked by many people to talk about it or to, you know, to talk about this. And what was so interesting about that was that we, we have me and Steven and Ryan are here because we've, fig we've figured out whether it's through therapy or through a lot of just like, time with ourselves or just persistence, how to survive already in this world that has been so unfair to us. Like we've, we've figured it out for ourselves and for ourselves to be able to be joyful and to move forward and to still be artists that like want to keep making art. And so to ask, even just to ask and to be, to be told, you have the space now, we're ready to listen, is like, insane because it it's you, i you i immediately gaslight myself i'm like oh my god like if i don't speak and i don't take this opportunity like how selfish of me like i should be like i need to be telling people all but like that's very unfair to everybody in that position as well because you're being asked to unearth stuff that you learned to deal with when you were five years old and you were bullied for being good at classical piano because that's what all asians are good at you know and i'm a very positive happy person and i've I've learned how to sustain. And so there's half of us who are like so desperate to want to help make other people more empathetic. And that's why we make TV shows like Pose and Special, because when you invest in characters that you see on screen, then you are by that feeling, you are being more empathetic. So that's our way of doing that. But man, if we don't, if we don't have the support of people who are at the top of the flagpole, it's just too hard of a mountain to climb. So I really don't, I don't know if I can answer that question because I am so far away from that, you know, but um, I do think at least these conversations are happening now. And I know like, I mean, Lily Collins is the best ally I could ask for in a scene, in a scene partner. She's all, you know, because even if something ha happens, not that it has it or anything like that, she's not saying, oh, this is wrong. This is whatever she's asked. She's there for me as a person like, you know, she's in tune with like when when I can speak up, when I'm uncomfortable to speak up, when I might be uncomfortable, and that you know, like that's that's what an allyship is. And so I I'm very hopeful because there are people like that now that we're working with. But man, it has to be it has to be really everywhere. I love that. I love that so much. And look, I think you actually bring up an incredible point. We don't know. We can hope, right? We can hope that this summer opened up some hearts and minds. We can hope that when people tune in to Special or Pose or Emily in Paris or anything, that people's perspectives change, that their points of views shift and that we get to, as you were mentioning earlier, Stephen, to a more just and kind of equitable world. Um, I, I wanna, we're, we're running short on time here, but each of you have such incredible things going on right now. So Ryan, I was very upset that there were only eight episodes of this first season. I'm waiting for this May 20th premiere. Can you tell us anything about what's coming up season two, or is it just like a buckle up and get ready? Well, it's half an hour. So, um, you know, it's like a real TV show now. Can you believe? Um, and then, so yeah, so it's just, it's, it's a lot. It's super gay. It's super disabled. It's like, it's, uh, it, I think, uh, I think people are going to really like it. We worked really hard on it. It took two fucking years because of the pandemic. And uh, I can't wait to just give birth. She's crowning right now. She's crowning. I love it. 
I love it. I love that you're living in the intersectionality of it all. I mean, that that I think was one of the greatest things about your show and it touches so many things. So I, I will be tuning in. Um, Ashley, you're in Paris right now, getting ready to ramp up season two. I hated that cliffhanger at the end of season one. Anything you could tell us? Me Anything too, else? honestly. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was the last part of the question? Oh, sorry, Any, anything you, you you can tell us or anything else exciting that you have coming up um, and in the pipeline? Oh yeah, well, we're, we're filming season two. Um, Girls 5 Eva is coming out on Peacock, May 6th. Um, I, it, it was my reunion with Tina Fey, which is, it's guys, it's so, it's Sarah Bareilles, Renee Elise Goldberry, Busy Phillips and Paula Pell. It's just like, they're magic. Like anytime I get, I, I think like a couple of years ago, I was like, I'm gonna manifest working with like a bunch of badass women. And like, it just, that, I, it was just the best. They're just like the best big sisters. They're awesome in that. And it was also choreographed by James Aslop. Amazing. I know Incredibly talented. Incredibly talented choreographer, James. Re yes. They are fantastic. Um, the best. Steven, I, I am devastated that, but I'm thrilled that we're getting one more season of Pose. Anything you can share with us now that you've wrapped um, I know you're getting ready for the big premiere too. How are you feeling in these in these moments? Uh, I'm good. I mean, I feel really full up. You know, the it was a joy and more than anything, a humbling privilege to write, produce, and direct this show. Um, and and I got to do it my way. You know, I'm really fortunate that I had, I had incredible collaborators and co-conspirators and that I had support in, you know, the most, one of the most prolific TV producers ever, Ryan Murphy. And so it made it so that I, as a first time creator, could tell the story in the way that I wanted to tell it. Um, and, and that's pretty remarkable. You know, it's like, we're not being asked to leave the party. We're making the, de the decision to be the cool kids who are like, I'm out. And so that's really exciting for us. You know, it's like, it's a complete meal. And so I know that folks are gonna be disappointed, but the reality is that, you know, these shows, they live on forever, you know? Exactly. So the, the three seasons that everyone has, like you'll always have them and you can go back to them and the message of them will always be the same, which is, you know, that your voice matters and you are loved and you are important and regardless of what your identity is you deserve to take up space unapologetically um and that's really amazing so that's beautiful and you know i i couldn't agree more what the work that you do every single day as creators actors is it is going to live forever so five six seven years down the line some kid is going to turn on pose and they're going to see themselves they're gonna turn on special, they're gonna see themselves. And I think that's a beautiful thing because the art will continue to live and, and the influence will be forever. So listen, I feel like I could truly go on for hours with you guys. I feel like we should do this next over cocktails, perhaps in Paris with Ashley, just cause she's, you know. Done. Totally. I, I yeah. think it's, all, you know, we gotta go to her. She's working, we cannot take the time. <laughs> but I, I will say, you know, I want to reiterate what I said at the very beginning, because I mean, it honestly, um, I have such tremendous hope for the future of this industry because of, of the three of you. I think you guys represent exactly the type of people who should be working in this business. I think you represent exactly the kind of storytellers who are, as you said, Stephen, unapologetic and bold and creative and thoughtful, um, not just because we need to see really fun, heartwarming, exciting, funny stuff on TV but because what you guys are doing is fundamentally shifting how people interact and see the world. And it's a really, really powerful thing. So on behalf of a, an incredibly grateful and supportive fan and friend and someone who hopes we'll, we'll stay connected to you all, thank you for the work that you do. Um, and we are so excited to be on this ride with you. So thank you for, and thank you for being here and being so honest with us. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben.